I would like to invite on stage a Stern Business School professor, founder of Invest Fund based on machine learning, Mr. Tarn. And I said, well, all the women in the Northeast tend to do a lot of shopping on Thursdays. And they said, oh, yeah, that's coupon day. What else did you find? And I thought that was really cool, right? Because I had no idea what I was looking for. Um, but the technology just seemed really intriguing. And then fast forward four or five years, I went to work on Wall Street, Morgan Stanley, where I brought sort of machine learning into uh, customer data analysis and uh, trading. Uh, forecasting, predicting financial markets. And that second line of work sort of became my sort of second profession. Right? So my career sort of bifurcated in 94. Uh, I set up a machine learning hedge fund in 98, and it's been running for 20 years now. The last 10 years or so has been completely on autopilot. And I'll say a little bit more about that as I go along. So when I started, my ambitions were relatively modest. You know, could I design a machine that could learn to trade as well as humans. Now, that was sort of my intention originally. And over time, um, I worked in finance, but I also worked in a number of other areas, like sports. I worked with one of the NBA basketball teams, the San Antonio Spurs. Um, I did a fair amount of work in healthcare and predicting diabetes complications, and building predictive models in these systems. And over time, I realized that the really more interesting and general question was, when should we trust machines with decisions, right? When can we actually hand over decision-making to the machine? Uh, and that's become sort of in vogue now. You know, certainly machine learning is hard. But that's a fundamental question that we need to answer because, you know, if you're going to let machines do stuff for us, we'd better be aware of the risks associated with ceding control to the machine. So if you look at the list of questions, uh, you know, I wrote an article um, whoops, uh, a few years ago called, Should You Trust Your Money to a Robot? But you can ask the same question in a number of other areas, like, should you trust your lending to a robot? Should you trust your tax return to a robot? Should you trust your compliance and operations to a robot? Should you trust your transportation to a robot? Should you trust your sports refereeing to a robot? Talking about sports refereeing, by the way, I'm sure you all saw the World Cup, right? And Croatia was pressing, and I was sure Croatia would actually win that game. But what happened? Griezmann dived, right? He went down. The referee gave a free kick. France scored. It changed the complexion of the game. If the referee had given Griezmann a yellow card, it would have been a different ball game, right? So I'm setting up the context here, which is that sports is a, sort of a high stakes thing, you know, just like finance is. And so, uh, you know, the question really becomes, how do we make this decision as to when to cede control of decision making uh, to the machine? I'm having even more problems than George did with this clicker. So uh, I'm just gonna, sort of really breeze through this slide, which is supervised learning in one page, which is you have a bunch of observations, you have a target variable associated with each observation. So in driverless cars, uh, that X is what the car is seeing in front of it in pixels, and the Y is a, either a human action or a, an object, like a tree, a car, a lane marker, etc. cetera. Um, in healthcare, it's um, you know, the state of a patient and why is the future outcome, such as the disease or a complication. 
Um, in finance, it's, uh, you know, in targeting, it's, uh, you know, uh, what a person looks at and do they buy something. Um, and in finance, it's the current state of the market and why is the future return, right? So that's essentially what happens. Um, can we make this a little easier? Will it become better if I move closer? Right. So that's essentially, and, and the machine learns the relationship between the X, which is the observations, and the Y, which is the target. But machines make mistakes, right? We've seen this in our autocorrect, you know, where you say, what the hell, I didn't really intend that, but you know, the machines do this kind of stuff all the time, right? So they make mistakes. And so, and they also can't explain their behavior, right? So the conundrum, the essential AI conundrum is, when do we trust machines that make mistakes and cannot explain their behavior, right? That's the conundrum in a nutshell. Uh, maybe if I turn this around, yeah, so that's, if I just tell you to advance, will you do that? That may be easier than me using the clicker? All right. So in finance, uh, the, in the investing landscape looks like this. Advance, please, right? It's high frequency, short-term, long-term trading. So I look, I'm looking at this in terms of holding periods. I'm going to try to get your batteries. Uh, I'm going to try to get a battery for you. Okay. Um, and so, you know, uh, in, in terms of those three spaces, if you ask yourself why are humans really so poor at investments, there's a number of reasons for it, right? Uh, well, I'm just going to talk and hope that someone advances my slides, right? We had, there's a very weak theory, right? So it's a very low signal to noise ratio. Um, we tend to get emotional. You know, we tend to take profits too early. We tend to hold on to losers too long. I'm sure you all had this experience, right? I certainly do. I do so much worse than the machine in my personal portfolio, right? Um, you know, hope and change, you know, this thing will change. I've already lost so much and you lose even more. Uh, there's overconfidence, like I'm sure this is gonna happen. Anyone who's overconfident in financial markets sooner or later learns their lesson, right? Then the market can tend to be really punishing for people who are overconfident about their decisions, right? So the question is, you know, might, be, might it be easier to find a good robot? And if you look at the performance across this landscape, measured in terms of the information ratio, in the high frequency space, you get information ratios of 10 or higher. An information ratio is essentially your returns divided by the volatility of the returns. In the short term space, it's less than one. In the long term space, it's close to zero, right? Humans do almost no better than random. In fact, often worse than random. The capacity of these strategies is inverse. Like high frequency trading, you're not really gonna be able to manage large portfolios because the capacity of the market is very limited. In the short term space, it's much higher. In the long term space, higher still. In high frequency trading, machines have won, right? The game is over. In the long term space, Humans struggle on. We continue to believe we can do it despite the fact that we do a terrible job. And in the short-term space, it's mixed. But I would argue that, again, the balance really is in favor of the machines in this space. Real quick comment here, the fintech lending landscape, right? Similarly, there's a lot of activity going on in the small and medium businesses. So when should we trust algorithms that learn from data? And the answer is, relatively simple conceptually, right? And that is that every problem on this planet lies on this predictum, uh, spectrum of predictability from completely random to completely deterministic, right? Every problem does. So for example, autonomous nav navigation, autonomous vehicles lie on the very high predictability end of the spectrum. Machines rarely make mistakes, like driverless cars, very few errors. On the other hand, online targeting just slightly better than random, right? We keep showing stuff. You know, people on average click one out of 10,000 times and with better targeting, that becomes 10 out of 1,000 times, right? But it's still a very low signal problem. Uh, investing, such as high frequency, short-term trading, is even more towards the randomness end of the spectrum. Lending lies somewhere in between. We have a lot more information about people before we make loans, right? Now, Traditional thinking was we should trust machines with highly structured problems and not with unstructured ones, right? And that thinking really flies in the face of reality because what really matters is not just how often we're wrong, but the consequences of being wrong, right? And so that's the 
cost per error, right? So just like George, who had a two by two, I've got a two dimensional, uh, two factor model of trust, and it's that straightforward, right? So if you look at the cost per error of driverless cars, it's very high, right? In contrast, the cost per error in investing can be engineered to be relatively low, especially if you hedge it, right? In targeting, again, it's no big deal if no one clicks. In lending, it's reasonably high. Right? If someone defaults on the million dollar loan, well, that's pretty serious, right? Relative to people paying you back. One loss can be worth a thousand gains, right? So that's serious cost of error. And this is what the model of trust looks like. It's a heat map, right? So in the lower right-hand corner, we trust the machine. In the top left-hand corner, we don't trust the machine, right? And it's sort of a gradual degradation. And that frontier that you see, the automation frontier, is where all of the action, all of the innovation lies, right? That's where things are really going on, right? Where we're moving through data and better algorithms, we're moving these problems to the right-hand side of the spectrum and increasing our trust in the machine. That's what data science is really all about. So AI refereeing that I referred to, right? The cost of error is really high. My prediction is that over time, the referee will essentially become automated, and the role of the human on the field will be to really maintain law and order, right? And to make sure that people aren't saying crap to each other on the field, right? Uh, to, to sort of do that, as opposed to be making the decisions, right? Because the machine can see and make those decisions so much better than humans can. Cataract surgery, likewise, um, you know, used to be um, a human endeavor. It looks like we've run out of batteries again. Um, right, and that's moved again into the sort of green zone, right, that we now actually prefer that machines do cataract surgery on us, right? So in general, the trend is really, uh, and with driverless cars, by the way, uh, regulation will really dictate whether things move up or down, right? So regulation can also have an impact on the cost of error. Now, the question you might have been asking is, what the, where does that shape of the automation frontier come from, right? Why did I have it as a straight line? And the answer is, I just drew it as a straight line, right? It could very well be curved like this, right? Which essentially means that we're being more conservative, right? So the shape of the automation frontier expresses like a welfare function or a preference function, right? And so the closer it hugs the x-axis, the more conservative we become and the less we are willing to trust the machine. Right? So it's, that's essentially what is going on now in AI, where through better data and better algorithms, we're moving problems to the right-hand side of the spectrum and increasing our trust in machines. There are some professions, like professors and policemen, which are still in the red zone, right? Um, because they require sort of real-time communication, spontaneity, but I can imagine where you know, most of me might actually be replaced by a robot as well sometime in the future, but for now, professors and policemen are still in the red zone. So where does this all leave us, right? What are the implications of all of this? What are the implications, uh, if I can get to the next slide, right? What are the implications, right? So this is a picture of a trading floor of UBS in the 90s, and the same picture of the trading floor 10 years later, right? Does this mean that machines will just make us obsolete and replace us, right? Because that's what this would suggest. But if you look at the evidence, it shows that after the financial crisis, we had a precipitous drop in, un uh, in employment, but it picked up again, and now recently it's at an all-time high. Employment in financial services at an all-time high. And if you look at the BLS statistics on employment, a lot of these people are data scientists, financial managers, auditors, right? So we're still not willing to trust machines with money just yet in terms of auditing, right? We still want humans to actually sign off. And there's a large number of auditors' jobs that are still not automatable, right? Um, so that's essentially what's going on. Now, I don't know if you... Uh, uh, followed a few weeks ago, there was, uh, and I just want to throw that in, it's not part of the presentation, but Amazon was using a system, was using a machine to make hiring decisions, right? And after using that for a while, after testing it, 
they decided, they realized that the system was actually discriminating against women, right? Well, why? Well, because the training data was biased, right? The training data was heavily biased towards men, right? And that's a big concern and an area of activity right now is that can machines actually perpetuate bias? Can they perpetuate inequity? Can they perpetuate inequality, right? Because at the end of the day, machines just learn from what they see, right? And if you're going to feed them stuff that's not so good, they're going to learn stuff that's not so good, right? So, you know, I'm the director of the PhD program in data science at NYU. Last year, we got 400 applications to the program. We admitted 15 students, right? There's currently a lawsuit against Harvard by a bunch of, uh, by a society of Asian students who claim that Harvard discriminates against Asian students, right? And, and, and that's going to play out, and it's going to be really interesting you know, how that plays out, right? And the question is, what are your admission procedures, right? The lesson to be learned from all of this stuff is that you shouldn't trust admissions to a robot, right? That is, you shouldn't actually, you know, we shouldn't get carried away by the fact that we have great natural language processing systems that we can train and say, wow, these guys are going to be successful and these guys are going to be unsuccessful. Because the cost of error for doing something like that is incredibly high, right? Same thing applies for hiring, admissions, things like that. At the end of the day, it's okay to use machines as a first pass, right? But those rules about how machines are being used should be made explicit. And we should look at every application. I certainly looked at every application out of those 400 to, in, to make sure that, you know, that, there was, you know, that the decision was actually a correct one. Right? So that's just a sobering thought. Now, here's the, the one unanswered question that I'll end with. And that is, when do humans have an edge? Right? Because this will have a huge impact on employment, and our ability to trust machines in a whole number of areas. In other words, when is man plus machine better than machine? Right? Now, I don't have an answer to this question. In fact, I think this is a very interesting PhD dissertation question, right? Because it, it, it really is worth that level of analysis, right? I, you know, I was in Singapore last year at the Singapore FinTech Festival, and the speaker before me said, oh, you know, like, look at this, all the evidence, you know, from chess. There was all these Kasparov experiments that showed that humans plus machine always beat the machine at chess. And I was like, yeah, but that's chess, right? I'm willing to believe that in game-playing programs where there's an objective reality, there's an objective truth, there's a high degree of expertise, I can sort of believe that, right? But my own experience in finance has been just the opposite. You know, I started by saying that I created an automated um, hedge fund many years ago. For the last 10 years, it's been running on autopilot. I've done experiments where we actually uh, tried to beat the machine and, some, and gave ourselves the leeway to override its decisions. We invariably did worse than the machine, right? And all of the evidence in finance seems to be consistent with that, right? That if you have a process, if you trust the process, if you've done the math right, then you should just let it be, right? So essentially what I'm getting at is that on my predictability spectrum, right, as you move towards the randomness end, I'm not sure that the answer to this is yes. Whereas I think as you move towards the predictability end of the spectrum, I would be much more willing to believe that maybe this is possible, right? So in very driverless cars, I think humans plus machines will do better than the machine, right? At least for now, right? And that's why we don't have cars driving us around just yet, right? Maybe they will one day in the future, right? It's hard to know when that will be, but for now, even, you know, with that very highly predictable problem where machines almost never make mistakes, the cost of error is high, and, and, and a person with a machine might actually do better. Right? But this is, to me, the one very interesting unanswered question that's going to have a big impact on our trust in machines and on future employment. Thank you. Thank you, Rasan. Now should we try another question-answer session? Please, ask questions.
please your questions if you have any. Services, but if you take the case with state services, uh, where machines sorry, what services? State services, state services yes. yes, where machine can help us really to automate or to make robotization in state services because uh, sometimes it's a political issue and it's very difficult to use machine or robots in decision making for some cases. In some cases, it's good and it's possible. What's your vision regarding the, uh, this, uh, this sphere? Well, I think you know my answer to that question, which will be that it really should depend on the cost of error, right? And usually we care about the worst case cost of error, right? Because that's what gives us a black eye or a black mark. So that even though on average the machine might actually work, you know, what does that worst case situation look like, right? So I think the question to really ask ourselves, uh, you know, when we automate um, these government services is, we know that things will go wrong, right? The machines will always make mistakes. But the question really becomes, what will those cost of errors be? Um, and that's something that we just have to sort of estimate as humans because the data rarely exists for those kinds of situations, right? So that's essentially we may need to make a judgment call on what those worst case cost of errors are and then make the decision accordingly. Thank you. I thank both speakers for brilliant speeches, though quite short ones, but thank you, though. My question, regulatory role uh, is working very closely with legislation. Regulators working closely with, with uh, legislation. In my opinion, regulation, uh, legal regulation is like fully automated. But what do you think about that? Um. So that's something that US regulators are dealing with at the moment with transportation, for example, right? Should there be a cap on the liability associated with error, right? Who's responsible for the error, right? Is it the operator of the vehicle? Is it the manufacturer of the vehicle? And what are gonna be the, 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 you know, the maximum liability associated with errors? Without answering that question, it'll be impossible for insurance markets to emerge in that space, right? So that's the area where regulation really comes in, is to define what the costs of mistakes will be, right? what the cost of error will be, and who's gonna bear those costs. Once we specify that, that'll really drive innovation and enable insurance markets to emerge in those areas. Right? So I, you know, I gave you the, you know, the navigation as, a, as the obvious example that, that, that's underway, but you can ask yourself that for any, you know, virtually any domain. Right? And that's the role of regulators, is really to define what people's liability is. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about something that you've mentioned. Uh, you said that machines make mistakes, and um, I may be wrong, but I think humans make more mistakes. Usually, if the program is properly written, it doesn't forget to do something, and it doesn't just, you know, malfunction. Um, so, what I'm curious about is why are you then choosing to um, mark the areas where the cost of error is high as the non-implementation areas? Great question. It's scary, yes, but it's, yes. Is, wouldn't it be safer? You know, that's a great question. And the answer is that we, we hold machines and humans to different standards of performance, right? We're much more willing to accept mistakes from humans because that's always how it's been, right? So we hold machines to a much higher standard than we do humans, right? I mean, last year, 40,000 people in the US died on road accidents, right? Three quarters of them were related to, uh, you know, some combination of being inebriated, being in rage, being tired, fatigued, all of that kind of stuff, right? But that's always been the case, right? So we always accept that, but we would not be willing to accept a machine being tired or malfunctioning you know, and, and, and running into a bunch of kids, right? That would be considered unacceptable. And it relates to the question that came previously, which is how do we really define those costs of error 
in those kinds of situations. But we need to do that, right? But, and the other related question that people sometimes ask me is, isn't it a question of how much better machines do it than humans? Because if machines do better than humans, well, then we should let them do it. And the answer is no, not always. And for the reason that I pointed out, which is that we just hold machines to a different standard. So sometimes we really care about how machines do relative to humans, but at other times we just assign an absolute measure of performance to a machine. And we say, this is what we need in order to trust the machine and hand over con uh, decision-making control to the machine. So right? it's just the matter of perception. It's, it's a matter of norms. It's a matter of societal norms, right? That, that it's just, that's the way it's been. And we are, we, you know, and, and we are actually continuing to develop these norms with machines, right? Because this is a whole new area, right? Till a few years ago, we weren't really even thinking about handing over decision-making control to the machine, right? This was a relatively rare thing to do. Right? Whereas now, we're actually confronted with the fact that these machines do really well. Right? Should we let them make the, machine, uh, the decision for us? Right? The same thing goes in healthcare as well. Right? Um, which is why, at the moment, we're not going to really let machines make uh, serious decisions for us. Right? It'll still be assisted. You know, the machine may sort of be de facto, but it's, there's going to be the human doctor essentially saying, yeah, you know, I, I sort of agree with the machine. If I may, uh, with a follow-up a little sure. bit, yeah. um, do you see the norms changing? Do you think that it'll take us, do you think technology will um, catch up first and uh, we will invent a machine that will be able to make decisions? Or do you think that people are going to catch up first? Are we going to be ready for the technology when it comes or is it going to be the other way around? Well, I think we're pretty close to being ready already. Right? So for, for, because a lot of decision making has already been automated, right? And, and it's happened without us even realizing it, right? A lot of targeting decisions, a lot of investment decisions, a lot of lending decisions, right? Um, you know, these days increasingly decisions about, uh, around object recognition, uh, you know, uh, weapons systems, like, you know, to some extent. So a lot of this stuff is already been automated or even handed over to the machine. I think the norms will continue to evolve as we go along. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that, that we'll start accepting lower cost of error. We might actually demand more of machines, right? Regulators might actually say, no, we, we want these machines to do better before we trust them with our lives and, and really important decisions. We have time for one more question. Thank you. You raised some very interesting questions, for example, about this cost of error, cost of machine error indeed, but there is still one very important layer remaining related to ethical problems. Like, for example, a group of scientists from Tula State University have you know, developed a hypothetical situation, like machine uh, drive by a robot is driving, uh, you know, a road, and then suddenly a group of kids are jumping on the road. What should computer do? I mean, uh, turn left and then the passenger dies? Or, well, continue driving and, you know, hit the kids? And. Well, so this kind of ethical problems, it's not the only area when such ethical problems can arise. But for example, if we use robotics in some, you know, military area, for example. You, know, you raise uh, the, the, the problem you're tra talking about is called the trolley problem. Um, and it's used by, you know, moral philosophers and ethicists to sort of point out this dilemma uh, that machines will face when they're confronted with decisions like this. My own view about that is that that scenario is a little artificial, right? That is, at the end of the day, the, the machine is going to do what it's supposed to do, right? Which is, it, it's not really going to be making moral decisions in real time. Like, do I kill that old man or do I kill the kid, right? It, it's just not going to happen that way. Um, and I, I saw a really interesting analysis by someone saying that, I think a lot of these situations are constructed, and in reality, they, 
you know, are, are probably somewhat artificial. You know, what if a car is driving in bad weather? It's like, well, it shouldn't be driving in the first place, right? If there's the possibility that it's going to make errors um, of perception, then it really shouldn't even be on the road in the first place, right? So the machine should say, I'm not driving in these conditions to begin with, right? So it should only be driving if it's almost absolutely certain, and I say almost, but the reality is that it's absolutely certain that it's driving in conditions for which it's been trained to drive, right? And that's sort of the way we more or less function at the moment, right? We expect machines to be used in situations for which they're trained to function well, right? And in those kinds of situations, a machine shouldn't be making that kind of a moral choice in real time. As humans, we might do that, right? Implicitly, we might do that. But I think it would be extremely difficult to program that type of sort of an ethical decision-making rule into a machine, right? The machine should be programmed to basically avoid accident at all cost. And the fact that it occurred would indicate that there was absolutely no way to avoid that at all, right? So it should, it should do the right thing, as opposed to be making decisions in real time as to who do I kill. If there are any other questions, we still have time. A, a, a more, you know, funnier, funnier situation. Can you imagine a financial market has only two actors left with the same machine? Who will win? And what will happen to the market that always has a loser or a winner? So, so let me answer a slightly different question, um, uh, which I sometimes get, which is that if all of the uh, trading is done by machines, uh, aren't all the machines going to be doing the same thing, right? And, and that's, so your, your question is actually a variant of that. And my answer to that is twofold. One is that for that to happen, every machine would have to have the same identical objective function. Right? I consider that to be a very minuscule possibility. And I say this because I've dealt with this problem for decades, where I've uh, created a machine to learn from data, and I realized that machine learning suffers from a variance problem. What that means in just plain English is that if I slightly change the, the training set, my outcome changes. Right? So I've done this for many years because the question I always ask myself is, should I trust, you, you know, which model should I trust? Model A or model B? Which one is better? Right? And my approach to that is to say, I want to go for the low variance outcome, the lowest variance outcome, because I want as much confidence uh, in the machine and as little variability in its decision making, regardless of how I change the training set to come up with the machine learning model. Right? So that's my objective function. But someone else might actually choose a different objective function. Right? Someone else might say, well, I actually don't mind high variance as long as my upside possibility increases significantly, right? So one of the things that is fundamental about machine learning is the loss function, a different way of saying what the objective function is, right? So it's very, highly, it's very unlikely that every machine would have the same objective function, right? Now, let me take the other side of the story, which is that, in fact, a lot of machines do do the same thing. And that's one of the big concerns these days in financial markets. In fact, just yesterday, I got a call from a Wall Street Journal reporter saying, what do you think this recent market volatility is due to? We've heard it's machines, that machine. And, and this, by the way, this is very typical, right? Every time something happens to the market, people say, oh, it's the machines doing it, right? And, and the answer is, I really don't know the answer to that question, right? But I certainly acknowledge that excessive machine-based trading can lead to sort of concentrations of positions where everyone is in the same position and someone yells fire, and everyone yells for the exit, and there's just like a limited amount of liquidity the market can absorb. And so in that situation, machines can, in fact, exaggerate the shocks uh, you know, due to the fact that they get crowded. Right? So I can take both sides of the position, and I think there's some truth to both sides. It looks like we have one more. The last one. 
общий вопрос. It's a general question. You work deeply with AI. Could you please tell, do you believe that in the future artificial intelligence will phase out humans or humans will still have a role to play in the future? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, if you, uh, if you believe uh, Elon Musk, you know, we'll all become exactly. sort of... Exactly, that was yeah, a question related right, right, to that. Right, right, so, you know, then we'll all sort of turn into some sort of hybrids. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, that's, you know, very futuristic. But I certainly, but I certainly believe that machines will become better at, uh, than us at many things, uh, especially perception-related kinds of things. They will see, hear, smell, feel better than us, more accurately than us. Uh, and so in that sense, I can believe sort of Nick Bostrom's thesis of the superintelligence, where they just become so much better than us. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, I certainly don't think they'll in any time soon have empathy or emotion or the kinds of things that humans do, uh, which are also really important, right? I mean, empathy, emotion, touch, all those things are really important. So, uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't believe that any time in our lifetime or even the next couple of generations we're going to see th any of this stuff. But who knows when we turn into hybrids ourselves, right? That's sort of science fiction. Thank you, Vasant, for your Thank lecture you. and extensive coverage of your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.